Hey everybody, it's Gomladex, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today we're going to be playing another Chromatic Cube Draft. Without further ado, let's just get into the draft. We've got a bunch of super powerful cards, as always, in Cube Draft. Several sweet ways to go. There's a Breach the Multiverse for a 7 mana card that mills each player 10, and then reanimates the best creature, Planeswalker, from both graveyards. Already super explosive in a normal draft format when you're milling cards like Vorinclex and Davriel and Gaunty. You're going to have some super sweet options in a cube draft, so Breach the Multiverse seems good. It is 7 mana though. There's also Titania's Command for another massive win condition. This is going to be 6 mana to put 2 counters on all of your creatures and make 2 2 twos. You get the 2 twos first, so you basically get 2 4 fours for 6 mana and buff the rest of your board. So massive, massive win condition for green, similar to Breach the Multiverse in power level. You could take the Vorinclex, which is a fun big hasty dork. Take Temporal Sundering if I want to try to do extra turn stuff. I might start with something really weird like Armored Scrap Gorger though, because I think that this cube is full of really big splashy finishers like Titania's Command, Breach the Multiverse, Sisters of the Undead, and Vorinclex, I think it's going to be pretty easy to have tons of different options at the 6 and 7 mana slot, so getting the cards that help enable those and help ramp you up to them early seem like uh, something that's going to be a much more in short supply, so taking the Scrap Gorger to help us play any of our big 6-7 mana bombs, no matter what they end up being, seems like probably a better place to potentially go. There's a Lurus of the Dream Den here, but a Again, I haven't seen a ton of great mana value two or less permanence in this cube, but this could be the draft where we try to figure out how many there are. We could try very hard to run Lurus in the companion slot if all of our permanents in our deck have mana value two or less, and that'll work out. It's a very, very powerful companion if you can get the cards for it, but it'll be really hard in this cube in my opinion. Could take Shark Typhoon as one of those big finishers. It's also just solid to cycle it away for a shark. Other than that, I guess we could go Gwenna and just have a very, very focused start on just green ramp in general, but I think Lurus is super powerful and pretty fun. If we can get Lurus to pop off, Lurus turns into an absurd magic card. So let's draft Lurus early here and really focus up on two mana and less cards when it comes to permanence. So yeah, again, as you see here, We've got like a Cityscape Leveler for an 8 drop to ramp into still. Mizzix's Mastery, you can overload for 8 mana to end the game. There's really no shortage of big expensive ways to end the game. I'm not super sure I want to scoop something up to go with Lurus here because Jadar and Null Priest of Oblivion are both powerful cards that work with Lurus. But Golos is another card that's an absolute banger, and if I take Golos, then I don't get to play Lurus in the companion slot. Golos is a mana ramp card that pulls out any land from your deck, puts it into play tapped, so it really helps fix your mana, because you can pull out a Triome with it, one of the three color producing lands, or even something that taps for a mana of any color. So Golos enables his own ability to get to that seven mana and start casting spells for free. Golos is a super, super strong card, and I'm going to take Golos there, even though we did just take the Lurus, potentially. Now we've got Gigantha, could try out a different companion. Don't get to play Lurus at all if Gigantha's in the companion slot, but that is a sweet companion for a five-color deck. As long as we don't have any cards with more than one of their own symbol, we can tap Gigantha to get five mana to just immediately slam down that Golos activated ability. So the five mana from Gigantha can only be used on colored mana, so it can only be used as the green, white, blue, black, red, all of that stuff. Can't be paid on colorless costs or generic mana costs, technically. So that is a downside, but I think it could still be really sweet and really fun to try to build around that. Probably just two into companions, but this format is 100% for fun anyway because, again, we're not keeping any of the cards that we're drafting, and all we get out of the event is some gold. So I'm just going to do what's fun here, and I think five-color Gigantha Golos nonsense could be a pretty sweet place to be 
for this chromatic cube draft. Now we have a Svela that can spit out these mana rocks that tap for a man of any color. That could be helpful. Cold Steel Heart is also excellent cheap ramp, similar to the Scrap Gorger. I want to take that really highly. Since we have a Golos, we also want to pick up some Triomes for sure, especially because we're going to be five color. But I think Cold Steel Heart also a very helpful card for a five color deck, even if it only gives us one specific color of mana. We get to choose whichever color that is when we play it. And again, two drops I'm going to take super highly, even if I'm not drafting Lurus, just because there are so many less good ones. All right, sorry, Branch Loft Pathway, probably what I'm supposed to take here is mana fixing, but I see another sweet five color card. I'm going to take another sweet five color card, the Kami War, getting added to our deck. Massively impactful spell. The only difficulty is making sure you can actually hit all five colors. Now I might take a Jet Mirror's Garden. Rod is an okay value spell where you can play lands from the top of your library, so anytime there's a land on top and you play it off the top, you've kind of drawn an extra card that way, which is nice. We've got some excellent removal with Blood Chief's Thirst and Static Net, but I'm going to go all in, no interaction, just take a bunch of great mana fixing, Great cheap mana ramp and try to get to big explosive five color plays as quickly as possible. Take a Jet Mirror's Garden. Because I have passed up on several Triumphs already, so I don't really want to pass any more. Love to play a Galton Mavern, but I can't do that with Dragontha in the companion slot. And there's also a Triumph here, so we've got a great pick we can make while avoiding the Galton Mavern. Again. That's my big recommendation whenever they do these chromatic cubes. They are loaded up on the finishers. There's Graz, there's Galta and Maverin in this pack still, and there's been like two massive finishers in every pack. It's the two drops, the three drops you want to take super highly. Because yeah, now Titania's Command wield. So did the Olivia Crimson Bride or the Sisters of the Undead. All that big late game stuff. So treasure map seems pretty good here. Cascading Cataract is actually kind of cool. We go down a mana when we use that, but it just hits all five colors for the Kami War or for Golos. Right, I have to tap six lands to get five mana, but still kind of neat. I'm going to take Cascading Cataract and see if that works out well or not. Uh, Debut of Detention is a removal spell on a stick. Magda can give us treasures early. Death Cap Glade is just a dual land, which is good. Uh, I think those are my favorite three cards. Meteor Golem is just a lot of mana. I'll just take a Death Cap Glade. Pack one, pick 11, take a Breeding Pool. Could go for Quintorius, but I don't think we're going to have a whole ton of cards ending up in our graveyard because. We're just going to be dropping down mana rocks on the board and then slamming down creatures for the most part from the look of things right now. So I don't think we have great synergies for Quintorius yet. Pick 12, take a Clifftop Retreat, although Guardian Idol, even if it is a colorless mana, is still helpful mana ramp. Play our big spells earlier. Yeah, we're not going to be like a three-color humans deck with Catilda. I could see an argument for Guardian Idol, but we do have two two mana mana dorks already, and now we have Svela to create those icy manaliths, which can be useful. She's also like a discount Golos. If uh, if Golos dies, or if we don't draw Golos, then we can just use Svela at three mana. Captain Sisse is actually kind of cool, but they are a four mana two two, so. If our opponent has any removal in the world, they're going to die immediately before they do anything. Ooh, Cultivate. All right, Cultivate is a super, super premium card for setting up your mana in these five-color decks, but Ornithopter of Paradise is another really sweet one. We definitely want to take the good mana fixing, the good mana ramp first. So it's definitely Ornithopter or Cultivate over all these powerful, big, splashy cards like Scholar of the Lost Trove. Actually, we can't even play Scholar in here because it's double blue if I want Dragonth in the companion slot. Um, but yeah, just just to mention again, two massive finishers again in like every pack. I think I'm going to take Cultivate 
it's just really, really good. It's going to give us two different colors. It's going to ramp us up and make sure that we have a land in hand to play the next turn and make sure that we don't miss our next land drop. I super like Cultivate, but I think it's pretty much impossible that I wheel Ornithopter Paradise, but I think it's also impossible to wheel Cultivate, and I think it's just a little better. Card is incredible. Omnath Locus of All, come on in. I could try to start wheeling these five color cards, but that feels unlikely. I guess I could take Kenrith and wheel Omnath. Omnath is much harder to play than Kenrith, because two or three color decks can play Kenrith and just use a few of these abilities. So I guess I'll take Kenrith, and this is where we'll see if anybody else is in five color, or if Omnath comes back to us. So we'll find out. Let's take Kenrith. Okay. Not much going on here. Terra Sunders, fine cheap removal. Canyon Slough for some fixing. Charming Prince for a little dork. Phyrexian Metamorph. Little dork. This is a pretty fun one, copying whatever you want, but we're not going to have a lot of permanence on board for that. I think green's going to be a core color. Let's take the green black removal spell here with Terra Sunder. Mana Confluence is beautiful. Tap for a mana of any color. Gotta take that highly. Atali is a super, super busted card, but uh, not castable with Dragonte in the companion slot. Plus, Mana Confluence is like probably the best land in the entire cube for this deck. Just straight up, you play it, it's untapped the turn you play it, you get a mana of any color every turn off of it. We have to shoot ourselves in the face, but it is what it is. Pack 2, pick 5, Lightning Bolt, cheap removal. You can throw that in any deck that has red. Honestly, we could take a Lightning Bolt here, be red-green at the core. So that we that way we have a little bit of cheap interaction. But Hydroid Crisis is also a massive, massive value engine. Not really a value engine, because it doesn't do it over time. It's just one big value spell, drawing you a ton of cards, gaining you a ton of life, getting you in the game there. Love Hydroid Crisis, love Lightning Bolt. Chromatic Lantern would be sweet in here too. Hard choices, hard choices. I think we are really red-green mostly. Dragantha, a bunch of green spells and colorless spells. I am going to take Lightning Bolt. I'm going to have a little bit of actual cheap interaction to maybe not just always die to aggro. Like take an Electrostatic Blast now. Two damage is not very much though, and we're not going to play a lot of instants and sorceries. Yeah, maybe don't take Electrostatic Blast. We could take Garuk. Four mana deal three to a creature, worst case scenario. Garuk just dies. Green-black duel feels pretty important. Any green duels in general are going to be really high picks. The World Tree, actually, though. No, yeah, we're taking the World Tree. Totally forgot about this card. If you get six or more lands on board, then you just have perfect mana, that's all. If you have six or more lands, they all tap for a mana of any color, and you're good. You're all set up. So we'll take the world tree, and then we can wait for our five color stuff till we have six or more lands, and that'll be a-okay. Mishra's Command for another removal spell. Not a great one, but fine. Play with Fire's another cheap one. One of these seems great. We can't play End Raise Forerunners with Gigantha in the companion slot. We could play Rip Apart, but we need to hit a white source for that. We could take a red-green duel. Take a play with fire. I think we've got a lot of lands right now taken so far. So red, green, five color looks like our deck. Everything except for our five color spells are exclusively red and green. Because Kenrith, while it is technically a white spell, it's basically another five color spell like these two. Binding the Old Gods is beautiful for this archetype. We get to use this as a 4-mana sorcery speed removal spell that destroys any non-land permanent. That's just okay. The beautiful part is that it's going to be both that removal spell and mana ramp that gets us almost any color if we have the right triomes. So as you can see, we have a Jetmir's Garden here, which means that the forest we grab off of Binding the Old Gods can be a forest mountain plains. It can be a 3-color land, so... Finding the Old Gods looks beautiful. Alright, now we can take a Prismari command for some cheap interaction. Have to hit a blue source for it, which is awkward, but 
That could be good. Maze Mind Tome could also be good as a cheap card that can set up our draws, gain us some life eventually. I actually might go Maze Mind Tome here. And we did wheel the Omnath, so we'll take the Omnath. Omnath wants us to have a bunch of two mana, two color cards, right? Reveal that card if it has, oh, three or more colored symbols. If you do add three mana and put it into your hand. Okay, so you just keep drawing a card every turn, but if you hit multicolored cards, you get to draw a card and get a bunch of mana. I'll take a Crag Crown Pathway here. Red and green are the most important colors, so this seems like a beautiful pathway to have. Joel Rail is strong, turning lands into flyers that can draw you cards, but I think we're going to be good on finishers. Omnath, Kami, War, Kenrith, Golos. Well, we're likely to get more. Take a Stomping Ground now because it's the two most important colors. And we get a Hydroid Crasis. I'm going to take the Crasis over the pathway, even though this is a green duel, which is great. Crasis is just absurd. Six mana for a 4-4, four, four, gain two life, draw two cards. Just gets better and better. Now we got an overgrown tomb nice and late and a rip of parts. If I can hit the white source for the removal, now we get a Tybalt as a finisher. Yeah, Tybalt is very hard to beat, especially in cube where the cards you're casting off of it are absurd. Tybalt is going to plus two to exile the top cards of each player's library. Tybalt's going to allow us to play any of those exiled cards, so plus two to draw two, minus three to exile an artifact or creature, and then we can play it because it'll be exiled under Tybalt. I'm taking Tybalt. That is absurd. We could take an Embercool, technically. You can play Embercool in a Giganta deck. I don't think Embercool's super good for this deck, but just worth noting. I'd love to Willis Ketria Triumph. That would be the one thing I'd be super sad to miss out on, but... Taking a Tybalt, getting a Cultivator's Caravan, or an Elvish Mystic or something would be pretty nice. Alright, we are great on finishers. Super, super great on finishers. So I can really just take Triomes now, and I'll do it again with a Zagoth Triome. Anything great here? Oh, Incubation Druid, though. Two mana Mana Dorks. Do I take those over Triomes? Probably. Take a two mana Mana Dork here ramp up into all these big spells that seems pretty premium and there's a bunch of strong cards here but again nothing we need take an incubation druid now go ahead and take a steam vents it doesn't look like i'm missing much by taking that take a feed the swarm grim flayer monastery mentor fibble fip what on earth is this alchemy card it has a scroll bar. <laughs> so much text, it literally has a scroll bar. Yeah, I'm not reading all that. Black Sun's Twilight? Fine removal spell? Yeah, I'll just take a Steam Vents. So that seems fine. Oh, Nico Bolas. Please, no two mana dork. No two mana dork, no triome. All right, no two mana dork, no triome. We are praising the god Pharaoh today. And you can't stop me. Pack three, pick five. We can take a Minsk and Boo, which is like a 5-mana 4-4 four, four Trample Haste at worst, because you just play this in plus 1, and then it just gets better, because you have a Planeswalker left behind also. Could take Into the Royal. Could take Oracle of Moldiah, which ramps us up quite fast and is a card draw engine. Might go Oracle of Moldiah. It's Oracle of Moldiah or Minsk and Boo. I'm actually going to go Minsk and Boo. I think they're a pretty powerful card I haven't had too many opportunities to play with before, so I like to play with the two of them. Seem like a pretty fun duo. Pack 3, pick 6, Zyatora's Proving Ground versus Invasion of Alara versus all these three color cards we could play that'd be sweet. Oh... Exile cards from top till you exile two non-lands of mana value four or less. Put one, cast one, put the other in hand. And if you flip it, you do some stuff. I think I just take a proving ground, honestly. Seven defense battle, you really want to flip it. I'm not that into Invasion of Alara, and it might come back, because I don't think anybody else is going to be into it. Let me take that Triome. 
Uh, let's see, double green, triple green, double red, triple red, double blue. We could take Alesha, who smiles at death, in a deck that's not going to have anything to reanimate with her. Or a duel. So we'll take a duel. She's going to have way too many red-green lands here and take a rootbound crag. Maybe I'm supposed to take Blooming Marsh. I'm going to take Rootbound Crag, though. I think I've made a mistake. I have overcorrected from the first draft, where I think I should have taken some more lands, got them more highly. I might have a little bit too many. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Oh my god, we get to play two basics. There's two forests, call it a deck. How many non-lands do we have, then? 18? Uh-oh. Might have to play a Faithless Looting. I can't play the Lurus, though. Um... Um, 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 um. Skull Prophet's a good mana dork. Not perfect mana fixing. Kinnon makes our Cold Steel Heart, Incubation Druid, Armored Scrap Corger. This fella's mana lift's all better, so it's four cards Kinnon synergizes with. Kennen's activated ability is not very good in this deck, though. I'm going to take this Mana Dork. Take the Skull Prophet. Take a Triome. Emmercool's still in here. Nobody's got the uh, the graveyard strategy, the self-mill stuff going on. I think that's the green-black deck. There's a lot of surveil and stuff that'll mill yourself, and then you could cast the Emmercool for pretty cheap. That's a little sad. Yeah, I'll take a Triome over the Mana Rock. Even though I need some more non-lands. <laughs> We could take, like, almost any non-lands, so we'll be fine. We'll find some nonsense. Theoretically? Okay, not out of this pack. We can't take these. Rezug doesn't really do too much. I'll take another Triome. Okay, now I have to take a non-land, which is fine. I actually think Big Score looks pretty nice. Discard a card, draw two, get some treasures. Set up the mana for whatever. All right, I'm not going to take the land. I'm not going to take Sheltered Thicket. I'm just going to take Zergo and Ojatai and have another big flying dork that uh, synergizes well with Omnath. Elena and Elena, another big random dork so that we have enough non-land cards. Uh, back Kelly Gardener, I think, actually. Seek a land, put it on the battlefield tapped. Yeah, for the ramp dork over the Borborygmos and Fibblethip. And I'll play that pathway. And this is our deck. We're, we'll just play these 44 cards and no basic lands. That's the deck. No, we gotta play some basics. We've gotta cultivate in here and stuff. Okay. So this is 43 cards. How many lands is it? 18 lands? We've got 18 non-basics. Oh my god. Okay. That's <laughs> that's maybe a little bit of an issue. 25 non-land cards. So I could cut like three non-land cards and run an 18 land deck here and i think that'd be perfectly reasonable because we know we're gonna have a three mana mana sink every single game where we want to dump three mana into putting this in our hand and we're gonna have a five mana card in our hand every single game so we're gonna want to consistently hit all the way up to five mana we have a bunch of cards pulling lands out of our deck as well as well as some big high mana value stuff so i think 18 lands is fine for this deck so Again, 25 cards means we get to cut three of our choice. And I think Faithless Looting is just not good without graveyard synergies of some kind or like cards that make you want to cast a lot of spells super fast. So I don't love that. I do like Lightning Bolt and uh, Play with Fire for some cheap removal. Uh, Tybalt needs to go to the seven mana pile. Scrap Gorger, Incubation Druid, Incredible. Terra Sunder is more removal, which is fine. Skull Prophet, probably good. Rip Apart is more removal with a difficult cost. Uh, let's see, this is four great little mana rocks. This is a card draw spell. This is another late game card, the Hydroid Crisis. Kind of sorting them into the piles to see what we have the most of and what we need more of. Cultivate is more fixing. Fella is more potential fixing. Back Alley Gardener is more ramp. Not exactly fixing because the Back Alley Gardener doesn't, uh, doesn't pull out... The specific land you want. I guess it only triggers when we play more creatures. Got 12 though. It's probably still okay. Uh, big scores card draw plus fixing, but mainly card draw, card selection. Binding of the Old Gods is mainly removal, but it's removal and 
fixing slash ramp. Blade and Lane is just a dork. Kenrith, just a dork. Minsk and Boo, just a dork. Zerg and Ojitai, just a dork. Golos, just a finisher dork. Omnath, finisher dork. Value dork. F Ooh, what is happening? A finisher, a finisher, and a finisher. Okay. I'm just going to cut Faithless Looting immediately. Two more cuts. Kind of want to just cut like a creature in a back alley gardener. Cut down on white a little bit. Well, how many random white sources do I have off of like triumphs and stuff? If I play zero planes, which is almost 100% going to be the case because I'm going to have to cut some non-basics to run some basic like forest mountain swamp for cultivate. Maybe I just cut a cultivate. That feels incredibly wrong, but who knows? We'll see. We have one, two, three, four. We have four random white sources off all the non-basics. Yeah, it's not a ton. Plus a mana confluence that's kind of like five. Okay, hold up a second, because, oh, this deck is, <laughs> this deck is going to be a nightmare to build. We need to figure out, let's just look at the lands, and if I run no basics, so if I cut Cultivate, is there anything else in here that cares about basics? Binding can hit any forest. I think Cultivate's the only thing in my deck that I need basics for. So if somehow the non-basic lands are like the perfect numbers of each color of mana, then maybe we do just run zero basics and cut cultivate. But let's see. What is the color distribution? Pretty even blue, black, and white. Because, what, there's like five... No, there's a bunch of three color cards, so yeah, that's interesting. Pretty even blue, black, white. And then even red and green as the number one colors by far. So, blue and red. This is red and green. Oh, this is going to be a fun use of the Magic Arena deck builder right here. I have to keep sliding on back and forth. So we figure this out. Put all our triumphs in a pile, because that's just not going to happen. Uh, Mana Confluence, Cascading Cataracts, and World Tree are kind of like five color. Now let's go green, blue, green, white, red, white, two, green, black. I wonder if Field of the Dead is in this cube. I would be so sad if Field of the Dead was in this cube, but we just didn't get it in our packs. Field of the Dead is the land, the non-basic, that if you have seven lands with different names on board, you get a 2-2 zombie whenever you play a land. That would be absolute nonsense in this deck in the best way. That's three blue sources. We probably want like three sources of white, blue, and black. So three blue sources. Wait, I gotta count the triumphs. Oh my god, okay. One, two, three, four... Five. Five blue sources plus mana confluence for six. Six straight up blue sources and a cataract and a world tree for late game blue. That's pretty good. On blue. On white we have one. Two. Three. Three straight up. Four straight up white sources. Mana Conflict's making it kind of like five, and then the two maybe late games. And then black, we have one, two, three, four, five, six with Mana Confluence and two late game. That, I really like these numbers so far. We might be on the zero basic strat. <laughs> 
It all depends on the green and red. Are we going to need to put natural forests or mountains in here to get there? Or are we good? Let's just count up green and red, stack red into a pile. I think somehow the counts are like almost 100% perfect for what we'd want. We have like 665 on white, blue, and black sources. Like right around there. Plus the two that are every color but only late game. And then on red and green, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 red. Plus mana confluence for 11, plus the two any color. That's pretty great. And on green, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 for the most important color, plus World Tree's always green for 12, and the Mana Confluence for 13th, that is any color, and the Cataracts for late game. We are the zero basic land deck. If somebody casts a Path to Exile on me, I am going to cry. Yeah, we're cutting Cultivate. Okay. Well, 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 we still got to figure out one or two more cuts, ideally two more with how high the mana costs go and the fact that we have a companion cost we want to play and a lot of tap lands. I'm going to wrap this up here so that it sorts it by mana value again when we look at it, but then I think I am going to cut two cards potentially. What? Shall we cut? So, Krasis needs to go up top. Tybalt needs to go up top. Terra Sunder's a four mana removal. I think Back Alley Gardener's a little hard to cast and a little inconsistent, as is Skull Prophet when it comes to cheap stuff that ramps into the late game. Need red, green, white, need black, green. Specifically. Back Alley Gardener needs other creatures. Skull Prophet can do it all by himself. I feel like it's reasonable to drop these two. Maybe Helena and Elena, though. Kenrith is actually pretty expensive for all these mana sync abilities, so up front we're spending 5 for a 5-5. Five, five. But if they can't remove Kenrith, then we just start reanimating the best creatures from everybody's grave over and over. I guess is the idea. Kenrith is an absolute monster if we hit it off of a Golos, though. I guess if I have extra mana lying around, but then because then I could hit like Kenrith and then also give the whole board trample haste after a Golos trigger. Or a Golos resolution, I should say. Probably supposed to cut Nicol Bolas, but that's never gonna happen. Nicol Bolas is our Lord and Savior. Get your blasphemy out of here. Yeah, I'm gonna cut the gardener. Maybe not the Skull Prophet. Maybe the Helena and Elena, because I think all of our other threats are already going to be big enough and doing a lot of explosive things on their own anyway. I really need to put two counters on them. I guess giving them haste is cute, but I'll cut Helena and Elena and the back alley gardener. Because back alley gardener, it's like we're going to play that and then by the time I'm playing another creature, it looks like based on our mana curve of creatures, like I'm already going to have 5 mana and a pretty good mana base going on because I'm going to be casting Zergo and Ojatai or Omnath or something. So we'll cut the uh, Helena and Elena and the back alley gardeners and then throw in, I guess, one forest. Because I do want... Wait, is this 18 lands already? Oh, this is already 18 lands. So I only needed to cut one of those. I'm a doofus. Then I'll just cut Helena and Elena. I'll try back alley gardener. Okay, I forgot that we had already had 18 lands in the deck because we have 18 non-basics. I'm so used to drafting not cube 
Well, even cube, how often do you have 18 non-basics? But I'm so used to drafting where it automatically just shoves 17 lands into your deck. It just stacks it up to your 17 basics, basically. But when you have 18 non-basics, then it just doesn't put anything in the deck. It's like, boom, okay, whatever. All right, so I had just assumed we only had 17 lands. My, my brain farted there. All right, well, we did it. We did the thing. We really did the thing. However this deck does, I feel like more than ever, this is an absolute, like, we did the thing five color deck. So that's going to be pretty cool. All right. I guess the mana base is all set. Oh, I do want to turn off those card styles for those triumphs and stuff. So I'll do that real quick. And then we'll get a nice little deck overview for those skipping around. All right, here's a look at our final deck for today. And this is a super sweet one. We really did the thing. We have 18 non-basic lands and our counts on our colors are really good. It's like 10 green and red sources and like five or six of the other three colors. So we've got a really good, really consistent mana base for this five color deck that's primarily green and red. We need the green and red mana really importantly because that's going to guarantee that we can always play a turn five Gigantha as long as we put this into our hand earlier with that three mana cost. And then the Gigantha can by itself cast something like an Omnath or a Kami War or a bunch of the mana for Golos's activated ability. So Gigantha is going to be a sweet one out of the companion slot there. But green and red are also incredibly important for a couple other reasons. Our green sources get us to Armored Scrap Gorger and Incubation Druid style cards to help us ramp up and fix our mana. And our red sources let us play early Lightning Bolts and Play With Fires to actually have a little bit of removal. We've also got a Svela Ice Shaper somewhat early on that requires red and green to produce some mana lifts and get us some more mana of any color and ramp us up. Back Alley Gardener, another cheap red-green card that makes it so anytime we play a creature, we get a random land from our deck into the battlefield tapped or into play tapped. We've also got Rip Apart, which requires red and one of our off colors, white, as an early game removal spell. And outside of that, for the cheap stuff, we start getting into the big stuff. So a couple more removal spells and the draw spell. Big score being an excellent draw spell for this deck because it gives us two treasure tokens when we cast it, which can both help us ramp into an explosive play next turn and help us fix our mana for them. So there's our removal and a little bit of draw, but then it's a mountain of bombs. We've got Kenrith the Returned King for the variety of powerful activated abilities to play around with. The really strong one potentially being giving our whole board trample and haste after maybe cheating a Kenrith out with Golos or something. That could be pretty explosive, but even just being able to spend one extra mana whenever we play another big creature to give our whole board trample and haste could be big. Zergo and Ojitai is a really good card draw engine. They are a flying haste threat that has hexproof the turn they come into play, and they let us draw one card out of the top three every time they deal combat damage to our opponent. Omnath Locus of All is a card draw engine that also gives us some mana every time we draw a three or more color card, which we've got a few of. Minsk and Boo is like a five mana 4-4 four, four trample haste with some flexibility added in. Pretty strong Planeswalker. Nico Bolas, speaking of strong Planeswalkers, one of the strongest Planeswalkers ever printed where the only thing restrictive about Bolas is the seven mana mana cost outside of that. Nico Bolas God Pharaoh is super, super deadly, casting spells from our opponent's library for free, exiling two cards from their hand as a plus ability, being able to deal seven to any target as a minus four for removal. Bolas is incredible, the Kami War is incredible, removal, a bounce spell, a gigantic dragon to beat our opponent's face. Then we've got Hydroid Crisis for a ton of card draw and some life gain to keep us in the game. And another atrociously powerful 7-mana Planeswalker, Tybalt, Cosmic Imposter, also letting us remove our opponent's threats and cast them against them. So a bunch of super explosive bombs, some great cheap little mana ramp dorks, some decent early game removal and card draw, a little bit of everything in this deck to help the deck play a little more consistently and hopefully just keep casting spells throughout the game until we hit some really massive stuff gonna be a super sweet one a super fun one but without further ado let's head into the gameplay and see how this deck does 
Here we are on the play for game number one. We're going to start with a tapped Steam Vents into an untapped Rootbound Crag for Incubation Druid, then turn three Death Cap Glade's going to come in untapped to play Svela. It's one of the awkward things about running 18 non-basic lands, is that I'm going to have to actually think a lot about what order I'm going to be playing my lands in every game. Oh, I could play Cold Steel Heart on white, and then I have five colors. Tempting, but not entirely necessary. I think I'm fine to go with the Druid here. They're kind of the same thing, except that Druid could be killed by removal, but it's okay if Druid is killed by removal, because we're only playing a three mana card next turn, not a four mana card. Alright, they are going to abrade the Druid, which could have also killed our Cold Steel Heart, although... I'm not certain our opponent would spend an abrade on a cold steel heart. Players are really happy to throw damage at druids, but a little less happy to throw shatters at mana rocks. So who knows? All right, we've got a Golos coming up now. Uh, if I play cold steel heart, that's just a weaker version of Svela's Manolith, and Skull Prophet is just a Manolith that could get killed. So might as well. Spend my mana on the Icy Manolith here, I think. Since I don't have to spend a card to get that, and it's just as good as playing a Skull Prophet or Cold Steel Heart, pretty much. We will cast a Golos next turn, though. There's an Archangel Elspeth. No creatures on board, so they're just going to get a 1-1 likely to protect Elspeth. Uh, but next turn, they turn into a 3-3 Flying Angel permanently, which is an issue. Let's get our... Fella, Manolith. I've got my five mana for Golos. Did not draw land number five, which is a little sad. If I poke Elspeth, then they have to put her down to three. Well, they have to put her down to one to put counters on their soldier. Seems fine. I think I need to go Los here. I could Gigantha to hand and Cold Steel Heart or something to just set up mana still. But Golos gives me a nice 3-5 if they don't give the soldier flying and make sure we immediately hit another land still. Let's go for the poke on Elspeth. They are going to chump, so they're just going to get another 1-1 next turn. Maybe trying to get up to the 6 loyalty to return all their cheap permanents from Grave to Battlefield later. Alright, let's grab uh, the World Tree is probably our best land generally to grab with Golos. Yep. If we draw one more land, then all of our lands will tap for a man of any color now. And we already have every color. Like, we have a Manolith, and all of our lands are two or three color producing lands already, so. Pretty much already perfect on mana, but World Tree can make it extra perfect. And I don't have any lands that do anything super fancy. They're just all for mana. That's the other thing that would make Field of the Dead super sweet in this deck. With Golos, you can always search out the Field of the Dead to always be able to make your 2-2 zombies. So if it is in the current cube, then... I'm very sad. I guess even if it isn't in the current cube, whether or not I could have drafted it, if I got lucky or not, I'm sad that I didn't get to draft it. Whether the reason is because I didn't open it up, it didn't get passed to me, or if the reason is just that they didn't put it in this cube. Either way, I'm still sad about it, because <laughs> it would have been awesome for this deck. All right, we've got the seven mana to just go to town, which I think I just do. I mean, I guess they can ultimate Elspeth, but there's nothing to ultimate back. I guess they get the Pyromancer back. Nahiri plus Elspeth together is pretty good, because they can discard another mana value three cards so that Elspeth pops off. Yeah, no, I feel like the strongest thing to do here is just three randoms over these. I guess I could Hydroid Crisis for like five, but I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to main phase it as well. Okay. Hey, Bolas. How are you doing, friend? Just shoot Elspeth. 
super flavorful. Here's Minsk and Boo also. Might as well. And uh, yeah, that was pretty good. Bolos is at three loyalty. We have two one ones. Chump block a one one with a two four, and Bolos should be fine. Or not even chump block, just straight up block with a two four. All right, cool. Do some damage to Nahiri. Actually, trample over for lethal because I think our opponent didn't realize that our hamster has trample for some reason. Because <laughs> Minsk is terrifying. Or is that Boo? Boo. Boo is terrifying. Well, I think we can go head empty mode now and just play whatever we want. Because we have a Bolos on board and a Golos. We can just keep using Golos and Bolos and playing whatever they hit at random. Like, we're just full chaos cascade mode now. We're going to play whatever cards we hit at random from the top of each player's deck. We get three of our cards with Golos, and then we get one of theirs with Bolos. I'm going to get them mixed up somewhere in the middle here and start calling them Bolos. The Bolos Dream Team. Take your peanut butter and your jelly. Your peanut butter and your chocolate. Reese's Peanut Butter Sandwich. Collective Defiance. That was actually very strong. They killed Boo and Bolos. We are still in an excellent spot, though, because Minsk and Boo just keeps making another Boo. I could sack Boo, kill the Outcast, and draw one card to guarantee they don't get a dragon. It's fine. I don't think I need the mana. Yeah, I don't. I'm just playing Golo stuff. Ooh, back alley gardener first, so we get another land from Zergo and Ur Ojitai. Urgitai. And then uh we pop off. They're down to 13. We draw another card, which is gonna be Omnath or Kenrith. Guess I'll take Omnath. I guess. I don't think it really matters, but Kenrith would make it more likely that we lethal them next turn. I'm pretty sure we're going to lethal them here. I guess if they board wipe us, then Kenrith would be better post board wipe. I think I already have more than enough card draw. Yeah, I don't need the Omnath card draw. It's just cool. Play the five color jelly bean. I love that we have the Gigant in the companion slot so that we can have that perfect five color mana rock at all times, but it was so unnecessary so far this game. Mizix's mastery to abrade our Golos. Oh no, I think... Oh. They clicked on the wrong side? Okay, there they go. It lets them redo it. Wait. They're still doing the three? I guess it didn't let them redo it. I think they accidentally clicked on the wrong side of it, and then it was like... It let them back out, but going back in and only let them do the same three damage part. I don't know. I, mean, I think they were I think they were trying to like a braid Golos and just destroy it, something like that. At least send a message there in the end. But that was monstrous stuff. War crimes were committed with the five color deck. All right, we won our PvP round, so we'll see how it goes PvE against NPC with Lutri in the companion slot. That is the free companion that tells us nothing about their deck except that they're playing red or blue, because in cube, you're already just going to have uh, one of every card in your deck. Uh, I don't think I need to shoot myself in the face and hold up a lightning bolt, so let's play our tap land turn one. Our Triome that always comes in tapped over one of our Shaw Clans. Uh, back Alley Gardener for turn three. If I get a White Source, Pathway is the White Source. So I can go Proving Ground as green, Steam Vents as red, Pathway as white. And I can play the Tome this turn. So let's do that. 
my brain is going to melt just having to think this hard about just playing lands. I'm going to be a mushy pile of potatoes by the time Lord of the Rings comes out with this cube. Uh, game's going slow enough. If all they're doing is putting their thing in their hand, I can just wait and draw my cards off the tome. So pathway on white now should be red, green, white. Perfect. Back alley gardener. And pass the turn. I'm probably going to start drawing Maze Mind Tome cards. Ooh, they've got five color as well now, just thanks to Cascading Cataracts. Look at this. No work done. Look at our board state. This is our five color. And they get to play one Cascading Cataracts? Ridiculous. There's a Molos for turn seven. I don't want to play a Bind of the Old Gods against literally nothing. So... I guess I could Krasis and draw one card, gain one life. I know I have a bow loss on 7, so I know I'm ramping into big stuff regardless. That's fine, I guess, because it hits the Gardener as well, which ramps me up. So that actually seems good to do. They might remove the Gardener in response. Can't imagine they counterspell here. Okay, big score, discard a card, draw 2, get some treasures. Seek a land, into play tapped, it's a mana confluence. Slam in for three. So I have five mana ready. Probably play a tap land next turn so I can play an untapped land on turn seven for Bolos. They're going to play a Magda, which gives them treasures whenever Magda attacks. If they get five treasures onto the board, they can also spit a dragon out, which I wouldn't expect to happen often, but it's possible. Planar Disruption, that's fine, because I still get lands when I play creatures. I just uh, don't get to attack or block with this 3-4. Oh, and they're just going to scoop it up. All right. All right, well, it is a game on Arena, so we'll never know exactly what happened here. Maybe their hand really sucked, maybe they had something come up IRL, and maybe they're just annoyed that I am not playing at lightning speed. Who knows? Either way, I guess we'll start things off 2-0 as we head into game number three. Here we are for game number three. Snap keep every time. Two five color cards in hand. Don't matter. Our mana base is literally perfect. I actually think I want to wait on the mana confluence. Let's play a green pathway, I think. Because I don't want to have to keep shooting myself in the face every time I play something when it's currently unnecessary. Because I can play Cold Steel Heart for now. Do this one on red, so we have green and red naturally, the two most important colors. And then uh, the black, blue, and white can come out of mana confluence, and that's fine. Until we get the cataracts mana. Got a Golos coming up. So I kind of need to Maze Mind Tome and draw the card. And then Scry, if we don't hit a land off the Maze Mind Tome draw. So draw the card now, Scry in our upkeep. So we're letting their Grim Flayer pop off, which means they get to Surveil 3, so that's pretty good for the Soul Tide decks, just green-black decks in general. In this cube format, there's a lot of cards that care about putting a bunch of stuff in your grave. So, it's going to be some good stuff for our opponents, since we didn't have a Lightning Bolt or play with Fire or anything for that Grim Flayer. Oh, they're just going to keep all three. That is probably not a good sign for us. That means they like those cards. Oh, and there's an Essica. Maybe they're five color as well. Maybe I misread things when they played Grim Flayer. All right, let's draw a card. Shoot myself in the face. Incubation Druid's the draw, which means we need to scry to try to hit land five to play Golos. World Tree enters tapped, but it is the mana that we need. Oh... What happens if I don't hit a land this turn? I have four mana up total, I just put a Gigantha in hand and pass. Feels pretty bad. Could Incubation Druid and pass. I think it's probably best to actually just play the World Tree. And an Incubation Druid and then pass, because then I have a lot of mana next turn. Versus if I put that on bottom and then just have zero lands. Tap land isn't the greatest, but it is significantly better than... 
just not playing a land at all. And now if they don't blow up my Incubation Druid, then we have 6 mana next turn, 7 if we hit an untapped land. Which I think is like 50-50, <laughs> honestly, with so many non-basics in this deck, it's like 50-50 untapped or untapped. We have a lot of shock lands and some pathways that hit the board untapped. Mana Confluence, Cascading Cataracts hit the board untapped. They do have Maelstrom Pulse on our Mana Dork. That's a sad one. Um, I guess none of our check lands hit the board untapped right now because we don't have any basic land types on board. So like Rootbound Crag that cares about having a mountain or forest on board would currently hit the board tapped. All right, scry again. Scrap Gorger. I mean, good card, good card, but I, I would rather just have a land. So dig towards that. Terra Sunder is not a land, but it can kill Essica, which is good. I could just Golos into the land now that I have my World Tree untapped, which does seem valuable. I can pick up a Triome with that. Yep, Golos it up. Because Golos can also block here. Or at least draw a removal spell from our opponent. Okay, we've already got the world tree, so we'll take a triome. Black, red, and green look the most important to our hand right now, so we take Zyator's Proving Ground. I guess I already have the green sources naturally and the red source naturally, so we just want to Black, blue, and white source naturally, but we can't do that. We can do black, blue, and green. I'll take that. That way I don't have to shoot myself in the face every time I want black or blue mana. Well, whatever combat trick you have to kill my Golos, go for it. Taking that bluff because even if I can't activate Golos, I can play an Omnath, a Kamiwar, or a Tybalt next turn. So it is super fine if Golos dies. Part of what makes Golos so strong is that even the front half is good for these five color decks, where sometimes you just need to land, and you pull out a land with Golos, and you're like, all right, good, now I can cast the rest of my hand, and this is one of those positions. I'm gonna put a stop in my upkeep again so I could scry and get the gain four. All right, we kill a Grim Flayer. Let's go. Feels good. It's going to be a minus three, minus three or something. Minus five, minus five, and pick up the Grim Flayer. Okay. Tap out for that. One, two, three, four, five, six. If I hit another land, we can play a Tybalt. But it would be a Tybalt where we have nothing on board. So I'd play Tybalt, five loyalty, minus three, the Grim Flayer. Two loyalty against a one, four. It's probably fine. I think Kami War is just going to be better to play, and I can already do that, can't I? No, not if I don't hit a land, because World Tree's green and Pathway's green. Cataracts can get me every color, uh, but it costs me a mana to do that. I spend six mana to get five, so I, I do need a land to play Kami War, so let's scry. Come on, untapped land. Uh, tap land is still good. I'll take it. That activates World Tree, which lets me play the Kami War. Because it's going to be our sixth land on board, which means now... Ooh, okay. Now all of our lands tap for a man of any color, so I don't have to use Cataracts to get the, the any color here. I don't know what's better to kill here. I'm gonna exile the Essica. I'm gonna let Grim Flayer hit me again. I'm gonna soak up some of their mana and stop them from replaying uh, Essica as the Prismatic Bridge. Because that's the problem, is the other half I bounce one of their cards and they can just replay it. Alright, there's a Golos. I'm definitely gonna Tybalt their Golos so that I can play my own Golos later. So we'll bounce and make them discard a card on Grim Flayer. I guess I could Terra Sunder Golos for only two mana, but 
it's going to be a lot better to be able to play a Golos. Because our deck is very happy to play a Golos. So they picked up a Cascading Cataracts with the Golos, I believe, so that they can activate its ability. And they milled in a Tali. Alright, so we bounce Grim Flayer. And they just discard it. And then we cast Tybalt. And exile Golos. And now I can play their Golos against them. And we have a Kami War about to flip into a gigantic Flying Trampler next turn. Feels like a great spot to be. Another sweet little combo that's working out quite well for us is the World Tree. Giving all of our lands the ability to tap for a mana of any color gives the mana confluence the alternate ability of tapping for mana without pinging us. So that is super sweet. There's a Hydroid Crisis for our opponents. So they get a ton of value here. But we're doing pretty fine on value ourselves. Definitely not so bad ourselves. Let's do the plus two because I can't minus again right now. Hit a Dragon's Horde and a Minskin Boo. Neither of these are super, super useful right now. Kind of want to tear us under the Krasis while they're tapped out, because they're pretty unlikely to have, like, haste nonsense. So, four mana for that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I have four mana to play whatever I want. Could play Dragon's Horde. And Skull Prophet. And still have Terra Sunder up. This might blow up in my face, but I'm just going to hold Terra Sunder up and hope they don't have like a counter spell. Uh, and this way I don't have to cast Terra Sunder on Hydroid Krasis unless they do something to my Okagachi made manifest. But I could get got by a counter spell, that would be bad. Nickel, Boas, God, Pharaoh. Well. Minus four deals seven to Okagachi. Probably the play. My victory is certain. We might go for random cards here, or make us exile two from hand, because we have two in hand. Okay. They're going to go for the kill on Okagachi, which means if I don't kill Gracis, they kill Tybalt. Um, but this means Nicobolos is at three, so if I do kill Krasis, even if I don't kill Krasis, I can just kill Bolos. So keep Tybalt alive, kill Bolos with Skull Prophet. I'm just going to see if this actually kills before I do anything else. I probably should have just played Minsk and Boo and made a hamster to attack Bolos, but... Alright, cool. I just wanted to really make sure Bolos is gone. Okay, we get some lands to play. Let's play an Omnath, I guess. One, two, three, four, here's five. Play a Golos. Kind of just can play whatever we want and it's gonna be good. Pass the turn. All right, there's the concession from our opponent. We have like 15 different ways to keep casting a bunch of spells, like massive card draw engines everywhere, explosive bombs all over the board, and our opponent is going to scoop them up. I believe we are now 3-0 and undefeated so far as we head into game number four. Here we are for game number four. Big fan of the hand again. All these non-basic lands coming in super hot. We've got a great curve of them where we play the Jet Mirror's Garden on turn one, pay two life to play the Stomping Ground turn two to get a Scrap Gorge or a Cold Steel Heart down, and then uh, we can play the Death Cap Glade on turn three and it'll hit the board untapped. So turn three I can play Tome plus Scrap Gorger. Yeah, I'm going to play the Cold Steel Heart to more guarantee that I can play two spells next turn, so... We've got red, green, and white already. We've got black in hand. Let's get the blue source from Cold Steel Heart. Sure. 
I've got a Bolas in hand, so I have a blue card in hand I want to have that mana for. It's not just like a speculative, well, I need my fifth color. Wow. Well. <sighs> Unfortunate. I feel like the majority of cards in the cube that would get me there would be cards that get the Scrap Gorger and not the Mana Rock, but they had the card that gets the Mana Rock. R.I.P. Well, Lauren doesn't do anything once they've already hit the board, except that they're playing blue, so there's a lot of flicker effects in the cube that could really pop off with Lauren. So I think what I'll do is I'll play the Scrap Gorger and hold up the red source for play with fire. So I could shoot Lauren to stop them from flickering or later. Because I don't need four mana on turn four anymore. Restoration of Agonjo, get a planes. Uh, then they get back a mana value two or less card next turn. Yeah, I don't think Play With Fire is really going to kill anything better, so let's just shoot Lauren before they do any flickery nonsense, if they have any flickery nonsense. Zagoth Triome, so some tap lands here. Could rip apart the Restoration. They never get their 3-4. Actually seems kind of good. I forgot this destroys enchantments as well. So used to the uh, red burn spells like a braid that's destroy an artifact or deal three to a creature. I guess I get to exile Lauren from Grave to really make sure Lauren's never coming back. I don't want to have to worry about any of your nonsense, Lauren. Right, I'm running quite low on cards. They have gotten a lot of card advantage from Restoration of a Gonjo drawing them an extra card. And uh, Lauren blowing up one of our cards and pulling a removal spell. Faithful Saluting is going to reduce that card advantage a tiny bit, which is nice. But it lets them select the best cards. Oh god, no. They are the Flicker deck. Oracle of the Alpha is a pretty obnoxious card, in my opinion. One of those alchemy cards I really dislike. It shuffles the power 9 into their deck, which is really cool in theory. The problem is they put it in these cube formats like Tinker's Cube, and you just draft all the flicker effects until your deck is entirely like Time Warp, or Time Walk and Moxes and Time Twister. Which is ridiculous. I'll keep a Hydroid Crisis, I think. Next turn I have 5 mana, which means I can put your Gaunt in hand and draw a Maze Mind Tome card. I think is what I do this turn. All right. I'm going to put a stop on our upkeep again so that we can scry again. Try and hit a land number seven. Any of our check lands should come into play untapped because we have every land type except... No, we have every single basic land type, so... Any root-bound crag-style lands hit the board untapped, all the pathways do. The shock lands. There's a lot of uh, potential lands that we could hit to immediately play Bolas next turn. They're going to hold all their mana up. Sublime Epiphany, hello. Really could be a multitude of various uh, instants. Scrap Gorger away the Faithless Looting, and we do hit an untapped land. And another untapped land. How bad is it for me if I try to play a Bolas and they Sublime Epiphany? It's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. They counter Bolas, make a copy of Oracle of the Alpha, bounce my Scrap Gorger... Sublime Epiphany is going to be a nightmare for me, whatever I try to cast. But I guess at least Hydroid Crisis does stuff even if it doesn't resolve. So we just go 5 mana Hydroid Crisis. 4 mana Hydroid Crisis gains me just as, love, just as much life, draws me just as many cards. So we could attack with Scrap Hoarder actually. As a 3-3. Three, three. And then just play the uh, 4 mana Hydroid Crisis. 
four, four flying trample, gain two, draw two, versus five, five flying trample, gain two, draw two. I think this is fine. And then next turn, I could play Dragontha and still have Maze Mind Tome mana up. All right, they allow the Hydroid Graces. And they do nothing with all six of their mana. They just hold it all up and pass. With instance in hand for sure. Now they play Yorian to flicker the Oracle, and now we get to run that Bolost out. Because we have played around the six drop instance. And they don't have the mana for it anymore. I think I'm actually just not scrying with the Tome again. We're just going to be full on drawing cards with it later. Cool. Let's play a pathway. Doesn't matter what I choose because I have a world tree down. Uh, but this way I can just tap my lands for Bolas. If I don't kill Yorian, they can attack Bolas well, but I'm really tempted to exile two cards from their hand because we know none of them are lands. They didn't play a land this turn. It's kind of greedy because they could removal spell Krasis and attack Bolas for like six. Bolas still lives though because Bolas goes up to eight here. If I minus Bolas, Bolas is at 3 and I have a 4-4 four, four to block the Oracle. I'm going to go for the minus, but I could see a pretty good argument for the plus here. I get to keep exiling stuff from their graveyard with this Scrap Gorger, so if they do draw into the Time Twister from the Power 9, they don't get to shuffle anything but lands back into their deck from the grave, which is cute. There's the Time Twister. The two cards that really matter from the Power Nine are the Time Twister and the Ancestral Recall. In terms of cards that are super powerful late game and draft. There's also Black Lotus and all the Moxes, but those tend to matter less unless they draw a bunch of non-lands. It's kind of like drawing extra lands here. Yeah, because they've missed enough land drops that they could have just played this much mana by this turn if they'd hit a land every turn. They're not that spooky to see these moxes. So the power nine are five different moxes, a black lotus, that's six of the cards. Ancestral Recall is number seven. Um, Time Twister is number eight. One damage to each of these. They're going to do some nonsense that does two to everything, I guess. Or just kill Hydroid Krasis. Um, I don't remember what number nine is. I know all the all the Moxes and Black Lotus is six of them. And the, oh, Time Walk, of course. Take an extra turn after this one. Yeah, that one matters a lot, too. Snapcaster Mage on Electrolyze rather than Ancestral Recall so that they can kill Bolos. Fair enough. Snapcaster Mage is pretty sweet in a deck with Oracle of the Alpha. Being able to Snapcaster Mage an Ancestral Recall or a Time Walk is pretty filthy. They're going to kill the Scrap Gorger. They have like a zero mana removal spell? For my Krasis? No, they're just going to let me keep Bolas. Interesting. They're just tired of me exiling stuff from their grave. They must have a time walk, uh, not a time walk, a time twister in hand then. Okay. Well, I could exile two cards from their hand, but then if they time twister, they just get a fresh seven anyway. So it's probably better to plus two. This is a weird situation where most of the time it would be better to plus one here and exile two cards from their hand. But they would just exile two non time twister cards and then cast time twister probably if I do that. However, if I plus two, I could just hit a Mox, which is like nothing. Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna plus one. Because they, they've put like two copies of the Power Nine in there. What are the odds I just hit a Mox? Let's see what we got rid of that they won't be shuffling back. Metamorph and Magma Opus. All right, not bad at all. I'm going to put the odds on super, super high. 
that they're going to Time Twister next turn. And try to kill Bolas with whatever they draw from that. Get another Triome. It doesn't matter because we have the World Tree down. And I'm just going to spend two mana on Maze Mine Triome, so we'll just play another land. Pass. Time Walk. Do they have Time Walk and Time Twister? They only have one of the two. It doesn't matter that much. Okay, they just had a Time Walk. That was the last card they kept. So that was basically just two mana sorcery draw a card for them there. Since we have the board state all locked up. One of the saddest time walks. I'm sure there has to be a world record for the saddest time walk ever cast, and it's probably one where like you die at the start of the extra turn or something. So it doesn't quite get there. Not the saddest time walk ever cast, but not that uh, that fun for our opponent. Let's just have them exile their hand again. See what their instants are. Mox Mox. All right. Well, Oracle the Alpha has been exceedingly rude to our opponent. I will say that much for sure. Yeah, and they're just going to scoop them up because now we have multiple flyers so we can start beating down and still protecting Bolas. And I'm going to have the five mana to cast Gigantha. Our opponent is super over it. We're now going to be four and oh completely undefeated with our ridiculous 18 non-basic land 5 color build as we head into game 5. Here we are for game number 5 with a really quick hand, a really rampy hand. We're on the draw so it's not going to be like blisteringly fast, but it's still going to be a very good one with an Incubation Druid and an Armored Scrap Gorger here. We are ramping. And I might even just play this Omnath turn 4, pay the 2 life. Turn three, actually, because I'll have three mana and a mana dork to get there. So green, blue, black. We need a red source. Green, blue, black, red. Well, that's four colors right there for Omnath. But I need I actually need a white source for Omnath. Because I can pay the two life for the black. So I would need Scrap Gorger for a mana of any color or Pathway on white. If I Pathway on white, then Scrap Gorger or Incubation Druid can hit the white source. So I need white, blue, red, green. And I'll save this pathway, I think. Let's play... I've already got a blue source. Let's play this one on red, the mana base in this deck. Jesus Christ. And then... Scrap Gorger. And if Scrap Gorger dies, then I have to play Branch Loft Pathway on white to have a white source. But if it doesn't die, then we're good. All right, Nissa of Shadowed Bows is spooky. She's going to hit us for three every turn with a Haste Menace Land and untap the mana to give them extra mana. Okay, so now I can play this pathway without shooting myself in the face on green, and I can go green, blue, red, white from Scrap Gorger and play Omnath. I guess I still shock myself, but with Omnath instead of with one of my lands. No! Maelstrom. Maelstrom Pulse on the Jelly Bean. Ah, oh, That would have been our best Omnath of the whole event. Turn 3 Omnath, that would have been so sick. But the Jelly Bean is pulsed. More mana. Awkward. Um... Probably just have to tear Nyssa asunder. This is a really big deal. Can start reanimating things from graveyards. From their hand or graveyard. So from their hand they can slap something on board. It's gotta be smaller than the number of lands they have, which isn't a lot, but still, this has been putting in a lot of work, so. I think Terra Sunder is fine. Let's get a tap land out of the way. So that gets rid of some of their mana ramp as well. Because Nissa keeps untapping a land every turn, which they could use for more mana. 
They have five mana card the turn they draw another land. There's a Shigeki, just a 1-3, but it can give them more mana, so we probably rip it apart. Just keep being super rude. Rude as possible. I guess my only white source is the Scrap Gorger, so I actually need to play Retreat to rip apart... before I tap the Scrap Gorger. Now I can tap the Scrap Gorger at instant speed to exile Shigeki from the grave. They have four mana. Nothing to do with it. Let's exile a Shigeki. Okay. Zergo and Ojutai. That's quite the draw, because I didn't know what I was going to do to try to close out this game, and Zergo and Ojutai has given me a clear path. And they have Hexproof the turn I cast them, so they can't removal spell them, and I guaranteed draw a card. Zergo and Ojutai, I mean, we could full-on play this game out like we're playing against a control deck in Standard, where I use their ability to keep bouncing them back to our hand, and I think I'll do that. So that they can never removal spell the Zergo and Ojutai. Like, I have to keep committing the mana to replay them, but I think that is super okay. There's a Golos coming up? Well... Okay, if I draw a Golos, maybe it's okay if they spend a bunch of mana and kill Zergo and Ojutai, and then I just pop off with Golos instead. So let's decline. My mind has changed. They want to kill Zergo and Ojutai, they got it. But that is really important to note. If you have an opponent that has like four cards in hand that they're just never casting, they might just have all removal in hand. And at that point, you can just always put Zergo and Ojutai back into your hand and just keep replaying them. Just don't play anything but Zergo and Ojutai. So that's definitely a path we could have taken. Safest path, but pretty slow. Oh, Nicobolas! The God Pharaoh returns, I see. They have a counter spell here? They do have one blue source thanks to Gilded Goose. <sighs> exile two cards from their hand or get one card for free? I'm gonna exile two cards from their hand. We know they're all non-lands. Guaranteeing Bolas is at least a three for one. We exile two cards from their hand and they throw a removal spell at Go at Bolas. Am I getting Bolas and Golos mixed again? Bolos and Golos. Get out of here, Crater of Behemoth. Alright, they're down to ten. I don't even know what they exiled, I didn't check. Uh, feed the Swarm Vorinclex. Alright, they kept the Terra Sunder to kill Bolas, but now they're down to one card, which is probably whatever they drew this turn, because I imagine they kept the Terra Sunder. Here's a Golos. And we grab the World Tree. And now the mana's beautiful for everything. Keep hitting with our Scrap Gorger. Scrap Gorger's been so great these games. Ramping us up early and actually getting some attacks in as a 3 3. Gigantha has 100% just been our cheerleader the whole time. I don't think we've cast a single Gigantha. And I'm not sure we will, because if they don't kill Golos, I'm just going to activate Golos's ability. Nissa! Has a minus one to destroy an artifact or enchantment? I guess they kill a Golos then. Yeah, that's bad. Plus one gives them a Phyrexian with power toughness equal to the loyalty, which is massive. I think I want to make Druid a 3-5 and attack Nissa with both to guarantee Nissa's down to one, even if they chump with Goose. And if they don't chump with Goose, Nissa's just dead. I could alternatively upgrade Druid and attack them with both, then they chump with Goose, go to two, but they have two foods to eat, so I don't think pressuring their life total is the best decision here. Uh, 
Are we going to play a Cold Steel Heart? And then they, they could just sacrifice Nissa to kill a Cold Steel Heart. Alternatively, they just uh, plus one and get a 2-2. Two -two. But a 2-2 two -two is pretty small. We can finish off Nissa through that. All right, Augur of Autumn does get them a land off the top, so good card draw there. They could double chump to save Nissa. They could double block to kill one of these. Either of those courses of action is pretty fine with us. And again, we're not hitting their face because they're practically at 11 thanks to the double food. So we need to deal with their board state and then try to kill them. And they're going to go for protecting Nissa again at the cost of an Augur of Autumn, all right. Here's a Gigantha. Cascading Cataracts pass. Actually should have kept that in hand, because we do have one copy of Big Score in this deck, which we have to discard a card to cast. So if I top deck Big Score, that is a dead draw. So if we draw another land, I'm going to not play it, just in case we hit Big Score. Forgot about that until right after I played the land. All right, Tybalt is certainly not a dead draw. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, exact lethal. We just exile the token and go to town. Opponent's going to scoop them up, and we are still undefeated this time with the fifth win in a row, I believe. 5 and 0 oh thus far. And that is the case for 5 and 0, oh, getting all of our entry fee back, as well as a few random rewards. No matter what, in the money as we continue on to game number six. Here we are for game number six now, and this might be our first hand. We actually have a little bit of mana issues because we do not have a white source for back alley gardener. Outside of that, we're doing great, but uh, we'll see. Maybe we'll draw a white source by turn three and just have perfect mana all day. But if not, we can always put Gigantha in our hand on turn three, which is fine. We've got a big score, which is nice. Let's get a tap land out of the way. Let's go stomping ground tapped. Play our Crag Crown Pathway on red next turn, because we've got, well, I guess we have two red sources, two green sources, so it doesn't really matter which side we play Pathway on. Put it on green, drop Maze Mine Tome, put a stop during our upkeep, scry now and scry during the upkeep trying to find a white land. If it's any other land we can put it on bottom because we have four lands already and a draw spell. So we can spend a couple of these scries to see if we can get super lucky here and drop a turn three back Alley Gardener. All right, <laughs> white source turn three. Let's see what counterspell you've got up for two mana here, opponent. Because here's a back alley gardener. She is strong enough to draw a counterspell or a removal spell from our opponent, potentially. But they don't have a two mana counterspell. I'm not sure exactly what's in the cube on that front. I know lightning bolt's in here, but that's not going to do four damage. They've got blue, red, and white. This pathway is also a black source, potentially, if they played it on the back side. So we know they're playing at least blue, black, red, and white. Might be another five-color deck here. And this is a red-blue pathway. Yep. Played on blue, so they have double blue. I think I'm going to drop another four mana Hydroid Crasis, gain one life, draw one card, trigger a back Alley Gardener if they tap out for some other nonsense. Because just triggering the Gardener to get another land on board is pretty valuable. All right. If they static net the Gardener, then I might just big score. That'll give us two treasure tokens to play a Bolas turn five. And we are not going to be able to play extra lands here. From playing the crisis anymore okay i don't need anything specific right now i don't need to cash in Ooh, one of these scry tokens all right this is 
probably wrong. But I'm going to cross my fingers and just slam down an Omnath, force them to play another removal spell. This is almost definitely wrong, because if they have removal, it's worse than just holding up a big score to play at the end of their turn. If they're planning on holding up a counterspell, if they were planning on holding up a counterspell, then this is better, because it casts something while they're tapped out, whereas if I big score on their end step and then try to bow loss, they can just counter the bow loss. So who knows? Ooh, two mana counterspell to kill our Omnath. That is not a good deal for us. All right. Yep, that didn't play super well, but we don't know if they had a counter. They did hit double blue specifically, so they might. Um, they don't have any card draw or anything on board, so we're still fine. They just have three cards in hand. Relatively even looking. Zergo and Ojitai? Listen, I'll just keep drawing things all the way up the curve. I'll drop a Zergo and Ojitai, and I'll let them use removal on it, because we have a Bolas coming up. I don't really want to spend all my mana every turn recasting them. I will pick up a land to guarantee land number six. Uh, so I can play Hydroid Crisis, where X equals four next turn, and then Bolas the turn after that. Cityscape Leveler. That is an incredible card here. Blow up Zergo and Ojitai. I guess we get a Power Stone token, which is cute with Maze Mind Tome. But, uh... That's a very big deal. And I don't have a lot of ways to deal with that. And even if I do deal with it, they get to unearth it. If I don't deal with it, they get to blow up my best card every single turn. I have to hit like Tybalt or Rip Apart or something. Scrap Gorger doesn't do it. Yeah, I'm just going to Scry again and then Hydroid Crisis for all it's worth. Proving Ground doesn't do it. Draw for turn. Overgrown Tomb doesn't do it. One, two, three, four, five. I'm going to play the Pathway so I don't shoot myself. And Crisis for four, so we can gain two, draw two. Looking for outs for Cityscape Leveler, but they just get to kill this by attacking. There it is, Terra Sunder. It's a very good out. Unfortunately, I don't have the mana up for it immediately. But being able to exile the Cityscape Leveler specifically is great. I'm going to be pretty low on life now, so this Ribbons might end up just killing me off this Gilded Lotus plus Ribbons. They have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 mana. They could do it for 7 next turn. I think I'm just going to die to a Ribbons. Make me lose 7 life after hitting me with a Spirited Companion. Just hit the Terra Sunder slightly too late. Let me shot myself one too many times. Trying to cast that Omnath. Rip apart my Maze Mind Tome to get rid of my life gain. And there's a rip apart of my own to get rid of their Gilded Lotus to keep them away from Ribbons. Or lethal. That is probably what I need to do. I just play Bolas, I die. So. Oh, don't tap the white source. Yeah, I think I need to blow up their Gilded Lotus. Then they have one, two, three, four, five. They specifically, they don't have double black anymore is the important part. Red, white. Destroy Gilded Lotus. Playing this first so that if they do have a counterspell, this potentially draws the counterspell. Because if Terra Sunder on City, Sk Cityscape Leveler doesn't resolve, then we 100% die. Okay, well, we drew the counterspell out of the way. Okay. How much mana are they going to have? Four ribbons? Enough to kill us. Actually, I think we still die then. 
regardless, because they're going to have ribbons. One, two, three. F so two and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I take one from companion and seven from ribbons. God dang it. Oh, actually super close. One counter spell away from recovering here and trying to win off of Bolas, but they had the one counter spell. And now we're dead. Cut to Ribbons, an absolutely absurd magic card that game. Two mana removal for our four drop Omnath, and a win condition in the end game that if they didn't have Engrave, we would be in a super stable position with a Bolas coming up. Insane stuff from Cut to Ribbons. We are 5-1 and one heading into game 7. Here we are for game number 7. I can go turn 2 Incubation Druid, turn 3 back Alley Gardener. Turn 4 Zergo and Ojitai. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. Turn 2 Guardian Idol for our opponent that is on black and white so far playing basic lands. What are you doing? Um, left top Retreat, Incubation Druid so that it taps for like every color under the sun. And then we play World Tree tapped and back Alley Gardener. Then we play Zergo and Urgitai. Zergo and Urgitai. I don't know why I always say it like that. Urgitai. Could play a Scrap Corger, but I think I would rather get the back Alley Gardener down. I guess I can't. I don't actually have a blue source for Zergo and Urgitai. I have just realized. So I guess I had to play Scrap Corger this turn if I wanted to play the big dragon next turn. Unless I get pretty lucky. Get a blue source, because Incubation Druid, easy to forget, but one of the few mana dorks that is not actually a mana of any color. It's a mana of one of our lands. <gasps> they played a Lorne of the Third Path before we played any artifacts or enchantments. Let's go. Okay. Well, I'm going to have a lot of mana regardless. Some back alley gardener stuff is going to pop off, so let's scrap gorger and get a random land. Play a pathway untapped and put a Giganta in hand and just start getting ready to play seven mana planeswalkers. That seems reasonable. We have seven mana on board if they can't kill any of our mana dorks, which means that we can start playing our ridiculous planeswalkers and going from there. Oh god. Well, there goes our entire board. They get to keep Lauren and a 1 1 flyer, though. That is actually pretty horrible for us. Now they get to attack the invasion of Fiora really easily. Wow, yeah, that was. Explosive for sure. Uh, I could cast a Zergo and Ojitai. Try to poke them with it, but then they can just chump block. And if I don't poke them with it, they probably just removal spell it and then hit our invasion. I guess if I'm trying to protect invasion of Fiora, just playing Gigantha is probably the best way to do that. Because either way, if they have a removal spell, Invasion of Fiora flips. So we might as well play the more expendable creature. Ooh, everybody draws a card. We draw a Kenrith the Returned King. Pretty good, but we need more lands before we can do a lot of nonsense. Oh god, no. Alright. I'll go home, Arena. I'll stop playing. I see how it is. Invasion of Fiora into Kaya Intangible Slayer. 
is the turn four, turn five play from our opponent, I believe. And uh, we don't have a board wipe in our deck, so this game is completely over. I've missed land seven also, which means I can't even try to like nickel bolos into hitting a board wipe out of their deck. They have hexproof now too, don't they? No, just Kaya has hexproof. Oh, this is this is big old yikes. I guess I can play Zergo and Orjutai and force them to chump with their Giganta, so at least they don't get to um, get a man of every color. Get all that mana out of it. I would be willing to put a large amount of money on us losing this game at this point, though. But we will play it out. We could just minus three again and get a 1-1-0 going Ojitai and just end Kaya there. They are going to plus two to drain some life, and they have a static net to kill Zergo and Ojitai. Alright, I'm going to scoop them up here. There's nothing that's going to turn this game around from this. We didn't hit land 7 to even try with Bolas, so... Um, yeah, I mean... That was brutal. Another game showing off the power of mana rocks in this cube, because there's just so few great cheap plays, and there's so many just super high-impact games. There's just so many super high impact cards that will absolutely flip a game into your favor that if you can play a couple mana rocks early and then play something like Invasion of Fiora turn four or turn five into a Kaya on like turn five or six instead of turn seven, it's just completely backbreaking. There's very little way to recover from something like that. So really showing off our opponent winning kind of the same way we've been winning a lot of these games with just a few early game cheap mana dorks and then just constantly slamming down bombs at the end. So five and two now as we head into game number eight. Here we are for game eight. Our opponent is on the play. We'll have a turn to play with fire held up. We've got a turn four binding the old gods to ramp into Kami War, then Nicol Bolas to try to close out the game. Turn one. Turn two, Reckoner Bankbuster from our opponent. Great value engine. Sees tons of play in uh, standard right now. Let's get our Triome out of the way, because we can't play an untapped land in Skull Profit, because we don't have any untapped green or black source in our hand. Spring Bloom Druid. Well, that doesn't really do anything as a creature. Uh, the big issue with this is... The mana ramp it gets them, and the mana fixing. Sacrifice a forest to get any two basics into play tapped. They're just going to get another forest and mountain. All right. Again, not going to play with fire just to kill a 1-1. One, one. Now I could have three mana, but not four. So I could play Skull Prophet and hold up play with fire. I think that's fine. Cold Steel Heart would give me a mana rock that's harder for our opponent to kill. But next turn, I think we're probably going to bind the old gods no matter what, which is going to then ramp us up that next turn. And then we can start doing the Kami War Bolas stuff, even if Skull Prophet dies. So that's fine. More mana ramp, a haro now, or a harrow. Not sure exactly how it's pronounced. Sack a forest, grab a forest and a mountain again, most likely. And that is the play.
Augur of Autumn. If they crew Reckoner Bankbuster, they can play lands and creatures off the top of their deck. Because then they have Coven, they have three creatures. Well, creatures with three different powers on board, so that's kind of sweet. But no matter what, they can play lands from the top to draw extra cards. Okay, so... They've got a one-mana creature on top here. This is going to be great value for them. Could go for the two-for-one trade into Bankbuster here. And then I can bind in the Old God's Augur of Autumn. That's honestly fine. This thing's going to draw them like three cards over the course of this game. So it kind of feels like a two-for-two. Two. Cool. Bind those Old Gods. Blow up that Augur of Autumn to get rid of their card draw. Now it's just whatever two cards are in their hand is what they have to play around with. Drop a Fabled Passage as their land for turn. They're at seven mana, which is huge. Hornet Queen, get a bunch of insects onto the board with flying. We are going to have to try pretty hard to survive against that. Let's grab a Triome. I already have a white source from a retreat, a blue source from the other thing. I don't think it really matters too much. Let's grab Ketria Triome. Okay. So, we'll have five mana up here, meaning we play a Cold Steel Heart and put a Gigantha in hand. Four potential green sources on board. Four potential red sources, one white. Two black. I really don't think it matters what color I cold steel heart for. Let's just go green. I already have a lot of green and red, but whatever. Get another green there. Get another red here. Put your gaunt in hand. And if they just had like one like super big creature, Call Me War would be really good at dealing with it. But it's the fact that it's five little ones. That's such a big deal. It's going to be two games in a row that we really needed to have, like, a board wipe in our deck. That is the one hole we really don't have filled. Yeah. Can rip apart and have one, two, three, four, five, six mana up still. But I won't have another white source for the Kami Ward. That's... A big deal. Means I can't rip apart and call me war. Nickel Bolas and hope I hit something incredible out of their deck. Seven. I'm one man away from Bolas plus rip apart. I guess I needed Cold Steel Heart on white just in case I top decked rip apart, but I'm not going to say that's like a definite misplay because there's probably other like two mana cards. That's a really easy thing to forget. The one of rip apart. Oh. Yeah, our best play would have been Kami War plus rip apart here, but since we can't do that, I think it's just. Prey? <laughs> Spin the wheel! Uh, Gilded Lotus does literally nothing. I guess that means I get to rip apart at least. It's sort of something. Down to five life now. Well, we were incredibly dead no matter what if their next card is Nyssa to give the whole board plus six, plus six. I guess plus five, plus five. This is not a forest. Plus five, plus five, Trample. All right. Well, a couple of really big bummer games to end it with. But what can you do?
Don't remember if we saw any good board wipes in our draft pot. I don't think there really are too many board wipes in the cube. There's really just that Invasion of Fiora that I've seen that our opponent Invasion of Fiora us to win with, and our first deck we were playing Invasion of Fiora to win, so... Honestly, that feels like really the only thing we could have done in those last two games, is just if we had a board wipe, <laughs> then we could win. But I don't think we had... We at least didn't have like a ton of opportunities to get board wipes during the draft pod for this deck, and... Having like one board wipe would be solid in this deck. But I don't see that as a massive flaw. We just played a couple games where they would have played well. All right, five and three, still a really good record. This draft started off incredibly with that five and oh. Always a huge bummer to swing around undefeated into just three losses in a row, but that's magic for you, baby. You win some, you lose some. Things are going to happen. Just hit some rough matchups for us. I don't think we got like massively unlucky with our draws or anything like the shuffler was rigged or anything like that. It's just we played against some decks that had some plays that were particularly good against our deck. Like just a single Hornet Queen's pretty hard for us to deal with because we can't like do a board wipe or anything. And we were on a slower start there. I think our opponent was on the play that game as well. Um, and then... Yeah, well-timed board wipe can also clear out a lot of our stuff, and then we can't really recover with our own because we don't have our own board wipe, so rough matchups in the end. Five and three, still a nice record overall, still going to break even and get some free rare rewards. I still had a lot of fun with this deck. I think this deck was incredible, honestly. I have no regrets about how I drafted this deck. Not a single... One. I guess theoretically I could have done stuff like taken a great spell over the Cultivate because we ended up having 18 on basics and stuff, but anything that I would look back on and be like, oh, maybe this would have been better, it's like kind of 100% in hindsight where I, I'm pretty happy with all the decisions I made with the information that I had at the time that I made those decisions, and I think they ended up in a pretty sweet place. This was a very fun deck to play with, and that is the most important part of building cube deck so we are going to be five and three for today's record but that is going to end this chromatic cube draft we got 40 gems very nice our two random rare rewards were both cards i already have a play set of love to see it love getting those extra gems towards drafting again in the future but that is going to end today's video as always i'd like to thank my patrons very much for supporting the channel as well as you for watching the videos if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you more in your recommended feed. We've got Lord of the Rings, Tales of Middle-Earth just around the corner. That is the next thing on the horizon. It's going to be a sweet format. We're hopping right in with the early access event in just a couple days. So stay tuned for that if you're interested. Other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.